Muy buenas tardes a todos y a todos los que han decidido acompañarnos en esta serie de conversaciones técnicas sobre establecimiento de vides y avances en la prevención y manejo de las enfermedades de la madera. Soy Francisco Díaz, gerente de socios y de comunicaciones del Centro de la Universidad de California Davis en Chile, institución que junto a otras organizaciones hemos dado vida a este ciclo de seminarios que comienzan hoy día y que se prolongarán la semana del día 8 y también el 24 con otras voces expertas. Quiero eh, agradecer especialmente a las instituciones y organizaciones que han estado detrás de la construcción de este evento, a la Asociación Gremial de Viveros de Chile, al Consorcio de Investigación y Desarrollo de Vinos de Chile, a la Asociación de Enólogos de Chile y también a la empresa Univiveros que ha jugado un rol de socio y de gran protagonismo en la construcción de estas eh, jornadas. Vamos a dar inicio. Quiero solo entregarles algunas indicaciones de carácter práctico. Eh, estas conferencias van a ser en inglés, no así el día 8 y 24, pero los expositores de hoy eh, gentilmente han dispuesto, traducido en español, las láminas que van a ir acompañando eh, su presentación. Eh, ustedes que asisten a, a este webinar no podrán poner sus cámaras ni micrófonos y eh, para aquellos que no pudieron registrarse a tiempo, señalarles también que eh, este evento está siendo transmitido a través del canal de YouTube de UC Davis Chile y eh, el evento estará disponible para eh, volver a verlo una vez más en el futuro a través de la web de el centro de UC Davis Chile. Para interactuar presentando y enviando sus preguntas, podrán ustedes usar eh, la botonera de Q&A o preguntas y respuestas según ustedes tengan seteado eh, su sistema eh, de Zoom. Preguntas que serán recogidas por nuestro moderador al final de las dos presentaciones que eh, tendremos en esta jornada. Por lo tanto, no duden en ir eh, generando sus preguntas que van a ser tomadas para conversar en la media hora final de este evento. Quiero ahora eh, presentar a quien va a ser el moderador de esta conversación, el doctor Dario Cantu. Dario es profesor titular del Departamento de Viticultura y Enología de la Universidad de California Davis. Él es italiano, nació y creció en la ciudad de Milán y en la Universidad de Milán se licenció en Ciencias Agrarias y recibió también su máster. Se trasladó más tarde al campus de Davis, donde obtuvo su doctorado en Biología de Plantas. Desde el año 2012 eh, es profesor del Departamento de Viticultura y Enología y la investigación del doctor Cantu básicamente integra los principios de la biología de sistemas, la genética cuantitativa y utiliza la genómica y la vía informática para diseccionar las redes moleculares que están bajo las respuestas de la vid al medio ambiente, a las enfermedades y otros asuntos. Eh, señalar por último que eh, Dario Cantu durante los últimos años ha sido un muy cercano colaborador de la actividad del Centro de UC Davis en Chile. De hecho, ha sido el líder científico de los proyectos 
de genética y genómica de Vides que se han llevado adelante con socios académicos nacionales y empresas del sector, en particular Viña Conchitoro y BSPT Wine Group. Eh, en la actualidad, y desde, de hecho desde el año 2019, Dario es también director científico del Centro eh, de la Universidad de California en Chile. Los dejo entonces con Dario para que él presente a nuestros conferencistas y sea después el anfitrión de la conversación al cierre de este seminario. Muchas gracias, Francisco. Y buenas tardes a todas y todos. En este momento tenemos más que 200 personas conectadas. Es un, es un logro claramente de, la, de los organizadores y de los socios, que agradezco mucho. Um, pero también creo que refleja la, el valor de los dos expertos que hoy día nos van a presentar su trabajo en, uh, en California, el profesor Walker y la doctora uh, Baumgartner. Uh, creo que, bueno, ya saben todos que la, la industria de, de vitivinicultura en California es una industria bastante joven, ¿no? Un siglo, uh, 100 años y poco más, pero es muy importante para la economía de California y, y creo que la, el desarrollo para el desarrollo de la industria de California y el desarrollo de la vitivinicultura en los Estados Unidos, el campus de Davis jugó un rol fundamental, un rol crítico. Y, um, y creo que en los últimos años el, uh, un, es, un esfuerzo muy grande de, de, de nuestro campus tuvo lo de, de extender, extender las actividades de extensión, de, de conocimiento y de investigación a otros países. Un país muy importante, un partner fundamental de nuestras actividades estuvo Chile. Y como Francisco mencionó, yo estuve parte de muchas actividades en los últimos años que fueron, um, que, que, que pasaron, que existieron, que, que tuvieron éxito gracias a la industria de Chile y también a los académicos, académicos en Chile que colaboraron con nosotros. Entonces, hoy día es un honor para mí tener esta conferencia, aunque en un formato que no es el formato uh, que esperaba. Teníamos que hacer esto en, en persona en marzo y pero agradezco mucho el esfuerzo de todo el centro y de, de los socios para poder hacer algo así en, uh, en virtual, donde quizá hay más personas que, que las que podían atender en, uh, en, uh, en persona, en vivo, en, en, en marzo. Así que, bueno, es un honor para mí presentar los dos, uh, los dos expertos y, y también creo que es um, el, la primera de muchas actividades. El, uh, el Centro de Universidad de Chile con, uh, con los académicos, los académicos de Chile y la industria de Chile está uh, empezando muchas actividades con una, un enfoque muy fuerte de extensión de conocimiento de California a Chile. Y una, um, un producto muy importante que, uh, que me hace feliz es, una, es un portal, un web portal que, um, que el Centro de Universidad de Chile en colaboración con Univiveros y otros en Chile está preparando para extender el conocimiento de vitivinicultura de California a Chile. Es una, va a ser un web portal que, um, uh, que uh, tiene informaciones de, de enología y de viticultura y uh, traducido en español, e informaciones nuevas e informaciones viejas que pero no estaban traducidas en español. Es un, es un logro muy importante del, del centro y de los socios y, y um, está hablando con Samuel hoy día y parece que en un par de semanas va a estar uh, disponible públicamente uh, para pa pa toda la comunidad y la industria uh, uh, chilena. Así que, bueno, uh, antes que introduzca el primer speaker de hoy día, quisiera recordarle que las preguntas um, uh, se pueden hacer en cualquier momento por el sistema que Francisco explicó, pero la vamos a contestar uh, en una hora y media después de las dos charlas. Así que, Uh, que tenga paciencia. Uh, uh, y uh, bueno, el primer speaker hoy día es uh, Andy, Andy Walker, profesor Walker, es profesor de viticultura y genética en UC Davis desde el 1989. Um, él uh, también consiguió su doctorado en UC Davis en genética y desde um, uh, cinco años el profesor Walker también tiene un título muy prestigioso de Uh, Rossi and Dow Chair en viticultura 
El profesor Walker uh, hace investigación y también enseña en el departamento, enseña toda la serie de práctica de viti viti viticultura en, uh, en, uh, en UC Davis. Y él, uh, um, como investigador, uh, uh, hace mejoramiento genético de, de plantas, de vid en particular. Uh, en vides, él desarrolla nuevas variedades de portaenjertos y de uh, frutales también que tienen tolerancia a salinidad, sequía y resistencia a patógeno, incluido uh, patógeno muy importante para nosotros en California y también para ustedes en Chile, como el oidio, y otros más importantes para nosotros ahora, como el Pierce disease, por ejemplo. Um, y como comenté, Andy es un mentor muy importante de nuestros estudiantes, enseña y también, uh, um, también tiene estudiantes de doctorado y de, de, de maestría en sus laboratorios, y no sé cuántas, cuánta gente graduó en, su, en, su, en sus años en nuestro departamento. Y, bueno, uh, hoy día Andy nos va a hablar de uh, métodos para establecer uh, vides y viñedos. Um, así que, bueno, uh, Andy, muchas gracias y thank you very much. Andy, the stage is yours now. And um, thank you. And the, the microphone. Good. Is that better? Okay. Yes. Okay. Good. Thanks very much for the invitation to speak. Um, it's an interesting experience to speak not only during during the pandemic, but during a, a webinar of some sort to all sorts of unseen faces. And we'll try to get my points across in, in English and um, When you speak Spanish with me, I understand about half of what you say, but I are more or less incapable of responding back quickly enough to <laughs> have a conversation. So that'll be slow down my, my uh, abilities there. So Samuel Barros asked me to um, talk about how do we establish long-lived vineyards? What are, what are the steps to thinking about how effective will this planting be and how many years will it survive? Uh, we know as, as viticulturists that you don't really make any money in the first uh, 10 years of that vineyard's uh, development. Uh, if you could extend that vineyard life into 20 years or 30 years, you would make far more money uh, in the later stages of the life of the vineyard. So the question is, how do you manage that and how do you extend these things and develop them? Uh, let me see if I can get this going. Hmm. There we go. Um, so there are issues we have to consider about about that, that how, to, how to develop these vineyards, um, how to, about the thought process that we go through. And the first is, of course, the status of the site, uh, whether it's a new site that's never been planted in viticulture before or agriculturally for that matter, it's, it's very important. Uh, if it has been in agriculture, whether it's been in annual crops or perennial crops, uh, tree crops in particular are, are bad to have vineyards follow, follow behind. They're often very full of fungal diseases that Kendra will discuss later, I'm sure, and um, uh, nematode problems as well it can be very damaging. Uh, I think in terms of what you're going to do next in a vineyard in, in Chile or California, that water availability and, and the quality of that water is the next most important de de decision to make and, and consideration to have. Let's see if it'll go, there we go, that's working better now. So how do we, how do we look at these soils? And the, the first thing is you have to dig holes and you, you can't really observe Uh, texture and, and stratification and, and layering and, and soil, tech, uh, soil uh, uh, characteristics and properties without digging some holes. And we generally try to dig uh, several per hectare uh, to get some sort of idea of the variability and to get some sort of idea on what we're going to have to do to break up compaction and, and disrupt the soil. So that, that's a, a major uh, cost and we, we want to damage the soils as, as little as possible, but we also want to make sure we have good rooting depth. So breaking apart these soils and the, and the compacted layers is critical to develop deep, strong penetrating root systems. And um, we've talked internationally for many years about the need to devigorate vines, uh, but when you put the, the concept of limited water and restricted water and restricted quality of that water as well, 
when you put that into the equation, we really must try to develop a stronger plant, more, more deeply rooted, more profound rooting systems to really allow us to, to buffer those sort of situations. So that's, a, that's become a, a, a more of a focus of, of people's considerations. Um, there again, this idea that, that we shouldn't disturb the soil as little as possible, so we best reflect the terroir of the site is is okay, and I think it's valid. Uh, but it really it really goes hand in hand with the idea that there's enough water to develop that as well. And when you have restricted water, again, they have to reconsider how how you're going to develop it and, and work with it in those in those situations. So if the vineyard's in place, you have a number of opportunities to look at it. Uh, you can start thinking about its vigor and, and probably the best time of year to do that is the middle of the winter. And you can see there the spur positions, the arms, the structure of that vine, how well it's developed, uh, how well those shoots and positions are growing during, during each year, uh, and how well the cordons are developed. And the vine will show you quite a bit about its internal health as well in terms of fungal disease and rot as it established well and then it slowly shrinks as, as time goes by and as, as the, the vines age. We also want to sample for soil-borne pests, particularly if you're following perennial crops, uh, particularly if you're following a vineyard and, and you're going to find that those, those problems are, are much magnified when, in those situations. Uh, most of those pests are in the drip zone of the plant or in the upper uh, 50 centimeters of the soil profile. That's where most of the roots exist most of the active roots exist. Uh, the roots will go to great depths and the whole soil nematodes and other, other pests, uh, but, but we're primarily concerned with that upper, upper profile and upper zone. And that's, that's true not only because that's the area where most of these uh, organisms exist, but also because we're going to be seeing uh, the most interactions with the new plant in that same depth. Uh, so when you replant into soils with high populations of pests, it's going to be a big, a big much bigger problem than if you hadn't. The nematode issues again vary based on agricultural use, previous use, um, and, and it can go back quite a ways. Uh, we're now learning more and more about nematodes and how persistent they are. We used to think that they were quite delicate organisms. Uh, they'll last three to four, even longer number of years without feeding. They go into some sort of suspended animation and they essentially are, are impervious to, to control during that time period. Uh, and of course, hatch out and redevelop um, uh, when you replant those situations. So, so soil-borne pests are, are rarely a big problem in a first generation vineyard uh, when we plant uh, into a new site that's not been in agriculture before. But if you're following agriculture in any way, it really has to be considered. So good, good constant sampling, uh, repeated sampling. And remember, of course, the most important thing when you sample is it, it doesn't matter that you do it uh, in a pattern or randomly or whatever, you just make sure you have roots. Uh, there, if there are no roots, there are, there are no, uh, no pests or, or no samples. So there are a lot of economic considerations. I'm not going to discuss those, but they're the most important ones. <laughs> so what to plant, um, uh, where, where, your, where your crop will go, uh, whether you have a contract for it, uh, the yield potential in terms of tons per acre or hectare, uh, all those are very critical and whether you can get a contract in the first place. So that's sort of a separate topic. And of course, it's, it's probably the most important topic that you could discuss. Uh, and of course, we're, we're going through a contraction again in the vineyard acreage, <clears throat> excuse me, in California. Um, but it's not contracting that far. Uh, during the, the pandemic here, people have been drinking more in many situations. And, and uh, there was a lot of pulling the vineyards to begin about the last after last harvest. And now people are starting to rethink of what they should plant and, and where it should be planted as well. And again, now, mark, now targeting not so much the high end of the market, but um, uh, the, the moderate end, the lower end in terms of the pricing structure part of the market too. Um, so as we look at those sites and we think about what, what we can apply to it, uh, historical information is critical. Uh, what, what was there ahead of time? How did it perform? That's all information you can extract from the previous owners. Uh, you can use a lot of aerial photography. There's more and more of that available. It can be done with infrared or NDVI, uh, where you get some sort of idea of, of the density of those plants and how well they're growing. And it can give you a good reflection on, on that soil and how consistent it is and how uniform it is in, in, in your vineyard area. Uh, so those are very important tools to go through and, and look at. Uh, we've already talked a bit about the, the backhoe pits and the soil pits. I'm gonna skip over that until we get back to it a little bit later. Um, and we're going to talk more about the adaptive flora too, which is something would be very, very important in, in Chile, particularly in, in Margaroides areas when you're dealing with the acacia and other, other problems, uh, to know more about what those associations are and how, how to 
utilize that information on best approaching your next vineyard is also quite important. Um, soil surveys are, are key. And again, the backhoe pit is, is critical, digging deep holes, uh, digging below the rooting zone. Again, the, the rooting zone is considered to be this 50 to 70 centimeter deep zone, but the roots will go much deeper. They'll follow water down cracks to, to great depths in the soil, uh, even to many, many meters, 10, 15 meters, but there won't be many of those roots. Again, the vast majority will be confined at the upper zone, but we want to know where those, those layered and compacted areas are that prevent good root penetration and depth. So packo pits are really the best way to go. Uh, dig deeply, dig, dig functionally, and look at those roots and, and consider how well they've done, how, look at that soil, consider how well it's going to support, um, support vineyards as well. There's all sorts of interesting soils around the world. Here's, here's one from Borosa in the upper, upper left-hand corner with this incredible red clay over an even heavier, denser layer. Uh, there's, there's some from our campus uh, in the upper right uh, where we have very extensive rooting in our soils. We have very, very friable, deep, deep uh, plunging root systems that develop there. Uh, the picture on the lower left is one with a uh, cobbly soil uh, that's overlaid with a lot of organic matter. And the roots are primarily, again, in that upper organic matter. They're not penetrating particularly deeply beyond that, but they will. Uh, it's just a matter of whether you can actually find those roots and, and see them. And in California and, and Chile too and parts around the world, there are lots of soil types and soil chemistries that really prevent uh, root development and root, root uh, growth. And it's important to have, to have some idea about where those areas are and, and how, how much problem they're going to present to you. There's many ripping tools and, and soil uh, compaction breakup tools that'll pull apart those soils. We have both ripping shanks and we have these big tailed shanks now that go through and sort of shake and vibrate as they're being pulled to break up even deeper, deeper soil levels. Um, the people doing this most extensively are those looking for the highest tonnages per, per hectare, or they're really looking at productivity to get down deep root systems to, to really fuel that crop. And of course, people are interested in doing dry farming, where, where we're going to be planting and, and not irrigating much or not irrigating at all. And in those situations, really developing that soil to a great depth is, is very, very critical. We want to make our soil amendments before we plant, uh, put in whether we're gypsum and lime are, are commonly used uh, to, to, to try to co compensate for uh, compensate for some of the problems in our soils and around, around the world as well. Uh, we'll incorporate that into at the depth that again, the, the rooting zone is the depth we're concerned about here again. So down, down 50 centimeters, I'm sorry, we're getting a phone call, apologize for that. Um, uh, so, so we're looking at that upper, upper uh, 50 centimeters and we're, blending that in and then reincorporating it and disking it through afterwards. Sorry about the phone. Um, so what sort of decisions do we have to make about, has come to in regard to rootstock uh, decisions and rootstock um, uh, uh, utilization? Uh, what are the key factors that fuel that decision? Um, soil depth and texture is probably one of the most important. Uh, the, the soil pests that are there now and what might be coming in later on as well. Uh, the potential for those pests uh, as well. So you may not be able to accurately sample for some of these, these pests and organisms in the soil uh, in, in an existing vineyard or in a replant situation, but eventually they'll build up. So getting a very effective thought uh, towards what, what's there and, and what, what's coming there is, is very important. Uh, water availability next, again, critical for, for Chile and California. Uh, certainly water is not going to become any more available in California than it is right now. And uh, whether it rains or not is sort of irrelevant at this point because the population has grown to the, to the point where we're really going to be reconsidering how we use water much more, uh, uh, much more aggressively in California. Um, the trellis and the spacing is important. And, and again, uh, whether we want to have larger vines or smaller vines, there's large vines, small vine uh, debate that, that's coupled with the, the high quality, more moderate quality uh, discussion that people have all the time in terms of, of tonnages and and, and how uh, productive those vineyards are or should be. Uh, a lot of that is fueled by the rootstock and, and we can afford to use very low vigor stocks for when you're getting very high, high values for, for your fruit. So that's a consideration. And, and in fact, when you use the wrong rootstock in those situations, you may develop too much growth and not be able to manage it in the canopy and man manage it on the trellis and, and leading to problems with, with light penetration and, and, and the plant development. Um, those are all very important considerations as well. 
So how do we think about the vigor of those sites? Those, this, the vigor of the site is really determined by the soil depth and texture and how much water it holds. So both uh, the amount of rainfall in that area and of course the amount, the amount that, it, that is available to the root system and, and how it's, how it's uh, divvied up to the root system as well. We want large systems for vigorous sites and, and uh, uh, or should say, I'm sorry, it should, should be uh, uh, on vigorous sites, you can get away with less vigorous rootstocks and less, less the vigorous trellising systems. And on very vigorous systems, uh, vigorous soil, lots of, lots of the growth um, and vigor promotion, uh, we'll, we'll be looking at larger trellising and, and wider spacing in those situations too. Sorry, I'm going back and forth between English and Spanish on the slides here sometimes, which is more challenging for me than, than for you. Uh, another big decision now at this point is whether we're going to mechanize and to what extent and, and to what level. And I think the answer is uh, in California, we're going to be mechanizing a lot more than we have been in the past because labor is less available and it's becoming less available in many places of the world as people find other things that are, that are easier ways to make money oftentimes in, in terms of uh, their, their mechanical, their, their hand labor. Uh, so looking into these things in terms of how we can mechanize most effectively is very important and that trellis will, will work around that. And to date, the most effective trellises have been very have been the vertical trellises that are in, involved in, in mechanized viticulture, because you can really contain the vine more uniformly and then apply viticultural practices to, to, to those sites more effectively too. The next next thing up is, is, is precision viticulture and to what degree we start applying um, uh, advanced sensing and other, other tools and techniques to really effectively look at those vineyards more, more qualitative, quantitatively and getting some idea for how they're performing and, and how they're developing. Uh, it's a very important uh, component of this. And again, a trellising system that's adapted to that will help, will help uh, optimize that too. So how do we establish those vineyards on rootstocks? And probably the most important thing is to plant high quality plants and to plant them properly. And it sounds like such a simple component and it's one of the things that's really uh, undercut to the greatest extent around the world. We spend very little time planting the vine and, and arranging the roots, considering how it's going to grow, um, particularly in light of the fact that that plant's gonna be there for a very long time and, and our livelihood depend upon it. Uh, and we frequently have situations where those plants are prop improperly planted and they lead to disease problems, they lead to rot problems, they lead to just, just straight out constriction and, and root binding problems. So it's very important to establish that, that material quick, well and, and properly. Uh, we like to use certified virus-free plant material. And, and, and again, it sounds very easy to say that, but it's often very hard to get the varieties or the clones uh, and the combinations you want with, with the certified material. And I know that the Chilean certification system is, is it needs a little beefing up and we can talk a bit, bit about that towards the end too. Uh, but even in California with an outstanding uh, certification program, we're often forced to make the decision to use non, non-certified material based on availability of, of what, uh, what sort of clone and variety and rootstock decisions we've made. It's very important to establish that root system first. And that's very critical. And again, that's frustrating because establishing the root system first means you're going to grow the vine. So it's producing leaves, but not fruit. We want all that extra photosynthate and, and carbohydrate to go into the root system and to develop a stronger, deeper, more, more resilient root system. So that's, that's the key to the development of those plants as well. And, and again, avoiding overcropping in the first fruiting year or years is very important. Uh, and, and, and we'll talk a bit more about that too. So grapevines are peculiar plants. They're, they're, not, they're not plants in many ways, they're vines. Uh, they, they do a lot of things peculiarly in terms of, of, of how we develop them, work with them. First of all, they don't really need roots to support them. That root system is not an anchoring. Uh, that root system is not a support structure. That root system is only there to, to absorb water. Uh, the, all the other functions, other, other functions are, are provided by, by uh, trees, uh, by trellises now in viticulture, but in the wild by trees. Uh, they, they support the plants. So the vine has not really emphasized the root system as an important organ most of the time. And more often than not, they grow in or near water. All the wild species, even the ones we think of that grow in desert regions or near desert regions, are actually growing in the spring in that desert region or in the, the catchment or water, water basin in, in those desert regions. They're not really drought, droughty at all. Uh, so they're, they need constant and, and, and uh, uniform water most of the time. So again, they don't need an extensive root system if they're growing in that sort of area. Uh, they don't need to mine water very, very often. They're growing where water is more available. 
So we think about the source sink relationships between, between the, the photosynthate being produced by those leaves and where it goes and, and where it goes first. It first goes to the shoot tips because that grapevine is, is designed to grow as fast as it can and, and high as it can in the wild. Uh, it next goes to the, the trunk system that's developing in amongst the trees and the branches. It then goes to the clusters and it's going to ripen fruit. Uh, but remember in the wild, grapevines are male or female and there are far more male vines than female vines since it's, it's, it's a cheap, uh, it's a cheap uh, deal to develop, um, develop a, a new, new leaf system if you're, if you're a male vine. And, um, and uh, finally, it goes to the root system. So that's the, the last way it sends its photosynthate. And that, that, that behavior is, is ancient and it's wild, uh, but it's ingrained into the way these grapevines grow. So the root architecture of most perennial plants mimics the top growth of that plant. So when you have a broad spreading tree that's open, has branches that, that run forwards, you often find the root system looks very much like that. You have a broad, dense, fibrous root mat uh, that looks a whole lot like the upper part of that plant. Um, and when you're a funny plant, like a vine that sort of rambles uh, uh, randomly through, through a tree and, and pops out wherever it needs to, uh, those root systems often typify that as well. They are they're much more um, uh, diffuse. Uh, they wander through the soil. They don't really form a, a ball or a crown. There are, in very few, there are very few examples of that happening. But in general, it's a very open, loose, diffuse rooting system. Uh, so it's, a, again, a problem we have to deal with in terms of how do we manage that more effectively? And how do we irrigate that more effectively too? So these grape roots are very important. Uh, again, we think about uh, farming for flavors. We think about farming for fruit. We think about a lot of other catchy terms that have been used to look at the way we grow grapevines, but we don't talk about farming for roots and, and we should. Uh, so we really should be thinking about how to develop those root systems effectively. It's a very important part of that, that, um, uh, that vineyard. So how do you farm for roots? Again, the best way to do that is to, is to not restrict the foliage. So, so um, we now have stronger plants, when, particularly if they're dormant bench grafts. We'll talk about those plant materials a bit later on. Uh, we'll, we find we can actually push them hard. You can develop your trunk more rapidly than not if you, if you want to add, add the time to it. We can bring them out onto cordon wires as well and develop, develop those cordons to begin with. But we're doing that at the expense of the root system. So remember that vine is programmed to grow as fast as it can up and it, it adapts to it well if you push them. Uh, but at the same time, it's, it's, it's short changing. It, it's not uh, supplying as, as much as that vine needs to the root system. So we need to reroute that and, and, and think about how the vine can be, can be grown more effectively and less vegetatively in a sense, well, less, less uh, trained in a sense. Uh, so again, it's, it's more leaves, more roots in, in, in essence uh, in, in, a, in a snapshot. Okay, so let's see. So we, um, how do we manage those roots again? Uh, how do we irrigate them most effectively? Uh, in the old days, we used to use flood and sprinkler irrigation all over the world, uh, and, and we still do an occasion, occasional spots, but water is so expensive and so unpredictable nowadays that we've moved primarily to drip systems. And grapevines really don't like drip systems very much. Uh, their root systems aren't very well adapted to them. So we have to think, I think, as we go along about other ways to more effectively utilize uh, irrigation and more, more effectively irrigate grapevines. The problem being, of course, that there's not enough water to really provide the, the full mass of roots that we really need. Uh, some of that's been done with subsurface irrigation, buried drip lines that go under, underneath the vineyard. Um, it, they're not very uh, easy to maintain and, and they often are attacked by rodents and, and they be damaged by, by cultivations. So there's lots of issues there. Uh, some people have started using movable uh, in row lines where they can take that sprinkler line and pull it back and forth across the vineyard so they can try to enlarge the root system. So we're trying to, in these, these situations, move away from the confined small uh, box to sort of uh, uh, cylinder of roots in the soil. We're trying to move away from that back to its more natural being, which would be larger, penetrating much more deeply and, and more broadly. Uh, our, our limitations are water, its availability, uh, cultivation, machinery, all those things are limitations because they're going to damage the root systems as well in that upper, upper zone. So you have to sort of think about how we can move towards that over time and perhaps try to utilize that. And micro sprinklers would be useful techniques, but of course, then you really encourage weeds and regrowth and, and uh, fungal problems at the same time. So we think about um, 
how do we get rid of the roots? And if, if, if the roots are there in the soil and they're the basis and the foundation for the next generation of soil borne pests and problems we're going to have, then how do we get rid of them? Uh, can, can we actually remove most of those roots? And there's a, an effort now to, to remove a lot of the roots we can find. We'll go through and rake through the upper parts of the soil, remove roots down to 50 centimeters, oftentimes perhaps a little deeper. It's very expensive and it does a fairly good job of removing those roots but it doesn't necessarily mean you've cured the problem uh, in, in that vineyard site. And remember that roots will go down essentially as far as they're able to, uh, it, particularly if there's enough, um, enough uh, local rainfall or, or enough uh, irrigation to, to encourage them to go deeper. So they'll sit at great depth and they'll host pests as well. Uh, we've been working on herbicide problems. We, we, our, our weed, uh, uh, weed control specialist just retired last week, uh, and uh, in, fact, in fact, he retired yesterday, I think, officially. And he and I have had a running argument for the last 10 years about how do we kill grapefruits? And he goes, I can kill grapefruits, herbicides can kill everything. And I said, well, I don't think you can, because there's been a lot of work done here in the late 50s and early 60s, 1960s, uh, looking at different herbicides and how we could most effectively kill them. So they would, again, not remain as a host for nematodes in the soil primarily. Uh, so that was the, the look at it. And they never, never were able to achieve that. And again, the, the trunk system uh, that's buried un, under the ground, the part we propagate from, the, the, the old woody cane that was originally propagated and grafted, that's easily killed. But the root system that comes off of it is not. And, and, and um, chemicals do not seem to really transmit through those systems to great depth to kill them effectively. So that's a bit of a problem. And, and they're going to be in that soil for a long time. We always think about using fallow more effectively. How can we use crop fallow as a site and leave it free of vineyard growth? All, in fact, all growth uh, for as long as possible to let, let things die off because there won't be anything to host them. And that's been something that's been looked at quite a bit. Uh, these bags of soil here, or actually bags of roots here, there's not much soil in them, uh, are, are a collection I made many years ago. And we went up and we dug on a hillside, a, a slate hillside, solid, solid rock. The vineyard had been removed seven years earlier. Uh, we could see the old terraces and we went through and dug down to great depth, uh, about uh, a meter and a half uh, and, and started looking for roots. And we were able to find some roots and I took those roots back. I put them in these Ziploc bags, took them back and put them on my desk for, for 60 days, for two months. And over that time period, those bags started sweating, which was odd because the soil was very dry and there wasn't much active life in there. Uh, but it insinuated that something was alive and respiring since, it, since the bags were, were taking up moisture. And a few more weeks after that, the roots started growing again. Uh, so it's remarkable. And those had been chopped off and, and they were down a meter plus in the soil and they were bone dry and they've been in the middle of our drought period as well. So uh, that's a problem. So when we think about how we're going to avoid these problems through fallow, uh, maybe, maybe it's not very practical. Okay, so Grape, grape roots and, and again the, the species and the rootstocks have, have different root systems. They have systems in some cases that are very fibrous and fine and rather superficial. And they have sis, as root systems in other situations that are quite deep and are much more structural. They don't produce as many fine fibrous roots. And we haven't really used that much um, uh, directly in rootstock breeding over, over the last hundred years, but we're going to start using it more so now. And people are looking at how that might influence drought tolerance, of course, and how it might influence the longevity of that vineyard too. So some, some are quite deep, some are shallow, and uh, they're, they're very interesting, the differences between them. We spent a long time, four years with a postdoc working on this in, in the lab and trying to quantify root systems more effectively. And in the end, it really came out that the very fibrous ones were lower vigor and very flat in general. And the very deep and, and uh, thick, thicker roots that plunged uh, uh, generated more vigor and, and were, were more drought tolerant as well. So here's Repairing Loire next to, to Salt Creek or Ramsey. And you can see the great difference in their root systems. And that difference persists from from young uh, three or four month old shoots that you can propagate to one year old shoots and to five or 10 or 15 years in the vineyard. We see those comparisons. And here's a picture of a comparison of 110R with, with 10114. Again, a, a higher, bigger stock uh, next, next to a lower, bigger stock and, and how those are performing too as well. So they're very different. One's very flat, one's very superficial, very thin fibrous roots primarily, and the other quite, quite more profound. So we did a lot of work to quantify these and, and we measured all these roots and looked at them. And I've tried to convince students and postdocs for many years, we need to categorize these roots. We look at the one on the left and we could say, that's a larger, deeper one. 
we look at the one on the right and we can say that's a very fibrous, fine, thin, thinly, thinly and shallowly rooted one. Uh, but if you actually measure every root and um, put them in classes and, and, and look at them that way, there are very few differences that are statistically significant because there's a lot of variation in the way these roots perform. And there's almost invariably in any root system, one or two large roots that go to depth and, and really get beyond this, uh, this other rooting pattern. I'm just going to skip over. There's, there's of course, three important species in, in our uh, uh, rootstocks, uh, Vitus riparia, Vitus rupestris, and, and Vitus berlandieri. And the key point one I wanted to make is that, that they're very different plants. So Vitus riparia grows along alluvial plains, uh, very fine textured, very slow, slowly eroding areas, uh, the constant rainfall up in the Northeast United States, and in these, these riparian areas. And up in the right-hand side here, that, that's like green stuff is mostly Vitus riparia. It's just rambling along in this fine silty material. So it doesn't really need to have much of a root system. And this is Vitus rupestris that grows uh, not abundantly any longer. It's fa fairly rare now, uh, but it grows in these, these rocky gravelly soils and, te and textured areas where you have this very coarse textured stuff. Uh, there's a lot of rainfall in these areas, uh, but the plants are growing in this water. So we think of Vitus rupestris as being fairly drought tolerant and, and drought adapted because of its deep root system. But its deep root system is there because if it didn't have a deep root system, the whole plant would be pulled out and eroded away. Uh, so it's there for a different purpose. And, and it's a, again, a, a different way to look at it. So we think of those stocks as being fairly, fairly um, uh, or rupestrous based stocks as being fairly vigorous and, and, and uh, good developing uh, root systems. But in fact, they, they, um, they, they are not drought tolerant at all. They're drought adapted in those situations. And Berlandieri, of course, was blended in to provide lime tolerance in, the, in rootstock backgrounds. And it's a very different plant from a fairly dry area compared to Riparia and Rupestris. And it has the very deep, much, much deeper, more, more structural, more, uh, much thicker root systems than either Riparia or Rupestris. Uh, so it's a very different sort of plant. It also takes up water through, through, uh, through the, right through the bark on the root, on the, on the roots. It's able to pull water through them and, and do quite well in, in many situations where you would be very surprised to see it performing well. Um, why don't we have Berlandieri rootstocks that are pure Berlandieri because it won't root from dormant cuttings. So we, we can't use it from the nursery perspective. And uh, it's always been hybridized with Riparia or Rupestris to, to get around those situations. I don't really want to say a whole lot more about rootstocks, but I've, I've categorized them into these four areas for, for basic types. They're types that are more Riparia-like, more Rupestris-like, more Berlandieri-like, uh, and, and more champigny I like here in this next set to sort of match the stocks that you, you, you use here. And we won't go through them again, it's a whole separate lecture, uh, but of course it's a very important consideration in developing a long-term uh, healthy vineyard. Okay, the one thing to remember about rootstocks is that the site overwhelms all, all else. So we talk about them being deeply rooted, shallow rooted, and how they perform, but, but that site and its environment is really the major driver. And that, that site is the primary, the primary causes of, of, or primary promoters of vigor and development are soil depth, rainfall, uh, texture, and of course, uh, natural rainfall too, and, and the water table. Okay, in California, we've been experiencing replant disease in perennial plants for a long time. And it really is the adaptation of soil borne organisms, uh, nematodes and fungi uh, to that root system. And, and then to their development to very high levels. So when we pull those vineyards and pull those orchards and replant directly over them, we often have this unexplained collapse of these lines. Uh, it's not all that unexplained when you start digging into it. Uh, oftentimes there are fungal populations that are distinctive and oftentimes there are nematode populations that are distinctive. Uh, so they can be very, very damaging. Uh, Kendra will probably talk a bit more about mycorrhizae and, and some of these fungi too, uh, but of course they've been disrupted and they may or may not perform as well in that next replant. Uh, and so how, how to actually rethink that soil and rethink its, um, uh, its health before, you're, before you replant is a very critical part of going through and, and establishing long lived healthy vineyards as well. Let's see here. I think that's where I should be. Uh -huh, good. <laughs> so given the loss, uh, uh, so to be effective, uh, anything you apply to the soil to control 
uh, pests, be they be they fungi or be they uh, nematode pests or or phylloxera or, or margaroides. Uh, they, first of all, they have to persist. So the stuff has to sit in the soil for a long time to be effective, and it has to has to penetrate as well. Has to get through the soil profile, and those are the very things we don't want them to do environmentally. So we want them to to go to be used at fairly shallow depths, and we don't want them to be movable or, or transmissible to deep to deep depths in the soil. So we don't want them to penetrate in any way. So we're at this this juncture now. Where we're trying to rethink how we can more effectively use fumigants. Methyl bromide, of course, has been eliminated, but it was it was the cure all for a lot of these replant situations where you could kill everything in the soil and then just start back and have it have it grow grow more effectively too. Uh, so as we go through and think about how to do these, how these, how these will, will work in the next, next generations, it's also important to think about how we can manage them. And there's work now going, going forward to be looking at trap plants in some situations where that plant is known to be an excellent host for a given nematode or fungal problem. And then the plant itself can be treated uh, and systemically uh, can control those organisms to some extent. And, and they're hoping that that helps, helps things work, but it's, it's difficult and grapefruits are there for a very, very long time in the soil. So what type of plants do we use? That's also gonna have really influenced a lot, tremendously influenced the longevity of that vineyard. Um, and we have green growing bench grafts that we can plant in the spring. Do I get ahead of myself? This is no. Dario. You have 10 more minutes. Yep, good. Thank you, Dario. <laughs> um, so we, we can, uh, we have um, uh, grafted plants that we can that we use now in, in most parts of the world. And even when we don't have phylloxera, when you're lucky enough to be like Chile, uh, you still have nematode problems, you have soil based problems, you have drought adaptation issues. Uh, lots of other reasons to be using rootstocks too. Um, so it's, it's important to look at these things critically. Uh, so we can plant them with green growing bench grafts where they're, they're, they're ordered this year and they're planted this year. Uh, so we can, they're grafted in, on the bench and we call them bench grafts and, and they're put in the vineyard. Uh, they're not put in the vineyard uh, at the nursery. They're put in the vineyard in your, in your site. Uh, so they're healed up over 12 to 14 weeks, 12 to 18 weeks, and they're, they're plants planted at the vineyards. They're relatively inexpensive. They can be very clean because we can monitor that root system and we can monitor what it's been growing in, uh, but they don't have a whole lot of stored carbohydrate and stored reserves. So they, they're, they're a problem in terms of, of, uh, of timing and, and uh, planting dates and things. We need to get them in when we can pay attention to them and make sure we can get water on them as well. Um, these, these are often potted plants now and we've moved away from, from de decomposable sleeves that were used once in the, in the past. Uh, we've now moved towards plastic pots primarily in California. And that's to, to really allow us and to think about uh, extending the time period which we can sell these plants and keep them and hold them before they need to go in the ground. And it's one of the reasons plants don't do as well. We need to be very careful about how we develop these plants and how we get that root system out and into the soil as quickly as possible. And the longer you keep them stored in pots, the long, the more, more readily they become kinked and root bound and, and uh, coiled in, in these containers. So these containers, although they're great for inventory and great for um, uh, storing materials, aren't necessarily good for grapevines and they, they should be used with caution as, as we go through. Okay, let me just check here, there, good. Okay, so there are lots of different ways to pot these vines up again. And, and uh, there's even a nursery or two in California that are moved towards paper sleeves and, and cotton uh, uh, socks almost. They can keep these root systems in, uh, but it, there's, a, there's a lot of ways we should be trying to get around that and, and trying to move, move these things into the ground more effectively and more rapidly, of course, is a prime, prime directive. It's some example of some of these pots. These are a smaller one now. Most nurseries have moved to a larger one at this point with more depth, more, more soil can contained. But in a way that only promotes the, the ability to leave these things around and, be, and not keep them, and keep them out of the soil. So to grow them as potted plants as opposed to plants that need to be uh, planted right away. Uh, in the old days, back in the, on the right here, you had a paper sleeve that would decompose. So you had to put that plant in the ground and, and follow the cycle of getting them grafted and into the vineyard. And now we've sort of broken that up by using these pots. So the pots are a tremendous advantage uh, for the nursery, but they're potentially a disadvantage for longevity of that vine if, if their roots coil up and bind and kink inside of them. So it's something to be aware of and to be very cautious of, I think. 
Dormant bench grafts give you a much better uh, plant material in general because it's lived for a year in the vineyard before it gets sold to you. And it's redeveloped root systems. It's, re it's rehealed its, its, uh, its uh, system. Uh, it, it had a better, better developed top growth and they're more expensive, uh, but a lot more forgiving. And they, they can make a longer lived plant. Uh, on the downside, if they're planted improperly uh, when the soils aren't really treated pr pr properly as well, they can bind up and kink and we can have problems with that as well. Uh, but here's an example of some, some freshly calloused and rooted uh, dormant canes stuck in the vineyard, grafted plants, and they're grown for the season and we we'll come back and pull those the following year. So of course they have far stronger growth too as they, as they develop. So there are planting issues, uh, of course. Um, I mentioned the, these, these socks that are being planted in now, but the, the major planting issue is, is the amount of time they're spending in the pots and the, and the, the lack of a nice smooth transition from that nursery uh, into, into the vineyard in those, in those scenarios. Here's one of my favorite clubs. Uh, it's good to get the attention of students oftentimes. But there's an example here you can see of the roots that are bound around that trunk, that underground trunk. Uh, that, that, that forms the roots. And there's several remarkable things. One is the fact that that'll kill the, that plant and it has in, in many situations. And two is that they don't produce a lot of new roots above this point. So they don't suddenly reroot above those kinked areas where the roots are bound and then allow the plant to survive and outgrow the problem. But in fact, it just progresses and get wor gets worse and worse. And just, I'd like to know why that happens, but it's a, it's a very peculiar phenomenon. Okay, so that's the first thing. Let's make sure we get these vines planted properly, get the roots uh, displayed out and into the soil. That's also very, very important as well. So if we plant high quality plants uh, well, that's key. We keep uh, kinking root systems out of, out of the, uh, out of the vineyard uh, by pulling the roots apart or cutting them off. If it's a dormant plant, you can trim those roots off. If it's a green growing bench graft, they have to be very carefully teased apart and, and uh, prevented from, from kinking. Uh, if we can, we could be, we should be using youth, uh, certified plant material. We should at least be making sure that those combinations are not known, uh, rootstock cyan combinations are not known to have virus related problems with them. And we can, we should be detailing that I think in almost every part of the world because there are many, many situations that are viral. We haven't yet discovered what the organism is that's causing the problem too. We want to establish that root system first. Don't stress them train the roots, uh, farm for the roots first, and then farm, farm later on for the rest of the development of the plant. And, and again, avoiding overcropping is, is key. Oh, wait, I think I'm almost done here. So other rootstock issues, is it a replant site or a new site? And again, that's absolutely critical that we go through the steps I mentioned at the beginning of the talk uh, to really look at the soil carefully, to look at the pest population carefully, and to make decisions about what's available. Uh, and you're going to find, I think, the most important issue with rootstocks at the end is availability. So whether, whether the nurseries are carrying or, or have enough material that you need in a clonal rootstock uh, uh, combination, and you have to make, almost always have to make compromises of some sort or the other. Um, this image here shows what happens when you have a brand new, both virus-free vineyards, with, or one virus-free vineyard, sorry, that's the one on the left. Uh, the, the one on the right was not virus free, was all, they're all young vines and they grew up, they showed symptoms and right away they, that virus started moving and has swept right through that other vineyard now as well. Uh, so it's, it's key to, 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 to maintain uh, clean material if we can and to, and to act as a community at, uh, in terms of how we, we keep them healthy too. Okay, let's see. Okay, so leaf roll, red leaf viruses, the, the whole host of viruses we now just lump under this red leaf phenomena. Uh, there's corky bark and many strains of leaf roll and there's, there's more of them all the time. Red blotch, a lot of other ones, but we can control them by using certified material. And uh, most plants that are sold in California are still non-certified uh, and it's a, it's a problem. And we need to be asking for a certified material and we, we often don't as well. So it's something we need to, to work on more effectively. I just want to say one word about maybe this is a prime time as we think about redeveloping older vineyards and how we can extend their life to think about establishing a, a better germplasm system here in, in, in Chile where you could start providing virus free material and certified material to expand upon the certified program that exists and to really think about how, how it would function more effectively and function across South America for that matter too. Uh, we're at that point again with, with our uh, certification program because of the 
the red blotch issue and we're rethinking how it should be done and what 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 virus free might mean and whether whether, whether virus test is enough in some situations and how we can best um, provide clean material too so at the foundation that's critical we need to make sure that we keep these plants alive and healthy uh, right off the bat, right, right, right from the beginning of their planting through to, that, to many years. Uh, we want to make sure those plants are healthy enough so they can start succumbing to some of the wood rot diseases. And that's what you're going to hear about from, from Dr. Baumgartner here in terms of what the, the other component of, of long-lived vineyards is how soon they become infected with wood rot diseases and then and how long can they tolerate that as well. Um, so with that, I wanted to acknowledge my funding sources. They allow me to uh, sit and speak with you, I guess, and travel to, 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 to visit with you as well. Um, and they've been very, very generous over the years in developing our, our rootstock programs and, and uh, sign breeding programs too. And with that, uh, I'll think they'll, I'll stop. Yes. And we can switch over to, back to Darling and over to Kendra. Is that right? Yeah, thank you, Andy. Okay, thank you. Uh, can you unshare or? What? Yep, I'm, yep. I'm gonna do that. That Thank you, Andy. So all the questions are going to be in the end. So, and we have plenty, so we may stay here all day. <laughs> uh, okay. Thank you, Andy. Uh, so now it's Kendall's turn. So it's my honor to in, uh, ah, it's my honor to introduce the second expert of the uh, Kendra Baumgartner, is an um, investigator in phytopathology at the Service of Investigation Agricola del Departamento de Agricultura de los Estados Unidos which in short is USDA, so more facile. Uh, and uh, su laboratorio uh, queda en el campus de UC Davis, entonces trabaja, trabaja uh, mucho con, con, uh, con uh, uh, investigadores aquí en campus. Um, estudió su um, uh, programa de pregrado en la Escuela de Silvicultura en la Universidad de Syracuse, New York, donde... Uh, Hizo un curso optativo de patología forestal que la convenció que la, la carrera para ella era una carrera en fitopatología. Entonces eh, se mudó a Davis, donde consiguió su eh, doctorado en fitopatología. Y ahora como investigador en USDA trabaja en, en mucho, muchos temas, um, la mayoría alrededor de enfermedades, de, um, de plagas, de enfermedades de planta, de, de, de la madera, de vid y de otros cultivos. Um, incluido el pistacho y a la almendra. Y hoy día no vamos a hablar de enfermedades de, de la vid y de cómo manejarla en, en, en campo. Uh, entonces, muchas gracias, Kendra, por participar. Y the stage is yours. Thank you. Let me get my presentation running. Thank you, Dario, for the introduction. And thank you everyone for tuning in. This is the first inter international webinar I've ever done. So um, uh, I wish I was in person in Chile with you now, but because of a pandemic, we're not able to be together. Um, as Dario said, I work for the United States Department of Agriculture. And today I'm gonna talk about the work we have done in California on trunk diseases. Trunk diseases cause chronic infections of the wood. And so it's important to prevent the fungi from getting into the vines in the first place. Vines with symptoms of trunk diseases typically look like this. The dead spurs, you can see this vine has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven <laughs> points where there is no fruit. Every year new infections occur and they, they mostly occur through the pruning wounds and the vines in this way become less and less productive over time. Trunk diseases reduce yields and thus revenues over time, but the cost of managing a vineyard, as you know, over time do not decrease. This graph shows how trunk diseases affect the returns, which uh, is an economic term for the revenues minus the costs. And the dollar amounts 
we developed here came from uh, management of one acre of Cabernet Sauvignon in the Lodi region of California. And it shows the cumulative returns over the course of 25 years for one acre of this wine grape. Planting a vineyard in California in the Lodi region costs a minimum of $12,000 per year. And that's why the, the starting point here at year zero, we say, is a negative $12,000. Now, because of this high starting costs, it can take almost 10 years to get back up to zero. These two lines show opposite extremes. In a perfectly healthy vineyard, free of trunk diseases, yields and thus the annual revenue should continually increase over time, up to 25 years. This dollar amount of $42,282 is the cumulative revenue from this one acre of healthy grapes. And this dollar amount represents the profit from each year combined. And there are profits from years eight to 25. The dollar amount of negative $39,662 is the cumulative loss for one acre of grapes with trunk diseases. This dollar amount represents the profit from each year combined. And there are only a few years with profit. These are obviously extremes, but they provide us with a reference point of just how bad trunk diseases can be. And obviously a grower would not manage a vineyard making negative amounts of money each year, but it gives you a point of reference. Trunk diseases start to impact yields between years 10 and 15, um, but the infections actually start much earlier. Part of our research was to work with social scientists to better understand what happens in the vineyard. We're scientists, so we can't know exactly, we're, we're not in your shoes, so to speak. We asked growers, what are some of the main reasons why they must replant vineyards? Um, and of the growers we surveyed, and this, these are the results from a wine grape survey, in the top three for many of the growers, they said it was either trunk diseases, viruses like Andy talked about, and then um, changes in market situation that made cultivars unprofitable for some reason. So trunk diseases are what I'm gonna talk about today, but Andy touched on this virus issue. Often I should say in my personal experience, when I see vineyards that are 20 or so years old in California, they have both very bad trunk disease problems and very bad virus problems too. For many years in California, we thought that these symptoms, the dead spurs and the wood cankers were due to one trunk disease, only Utypa dieback, it's called. And a former colleague of mine who has since died, Doug Gubler, was a scientist here in Davis for many years and he studied these trunk diseases and his research and his worldwide presentations were very much responsible for identifying the fact that it's not just Utypa dieback causing these symptoms, but that there are other dieback type diseases, some of which cause very similar symptoms. These three different diseases, Botryosphaeria dieback, Fulmopsis dieback, and Utypa dieback um, can occur together uh, in different combinations in vineyards. I refer to them as the dieback type diseases. Interestingly, um, Utypa dieback happens to be one of the least common of these three. Definitely the most common is Botryosphaeria dieback in California. And from what I understand, you don't have Utypa dieback. Uh, it's not been reported from grape in Chile, as far as I know. In California, in addition to these three dieback type diseases, Botryosphaeria, Fomopsis, and Utypa dieback, we also have another trunk disease, ESCA, um, which is quite different. Uh, it, it causes different symptoms and it's caused by a whole different set of fungi. 
Here I've listed some of the different, the scientific names for the different fungi. Um, I don't want to, I don't want you to have to remember these names because it seems they're changing constantly uh, in the scientific literature. Um, it's confusing even for me. But the point I try to make here is that you can see there are different names for each of these diseases. These fungi are not genetically related to each other. Um, and so what we know about the spread of trunk diseases and how to manage them mostly goes back to this one, Eutypa dieback, and the causal fungus Eutypa lata, because for many years, it's what we as scientists thought was the only thing causing all of these diseases. And it's taken some time for us to learn important details about these other fungi as well. ESCA is, um, causes very distinct leaf symptoms. I've, I've shown a, a range of different pictures here. Um, some of these are table grapes, some of these are wine grapes, some are from California, from France, from the state of Texas, where they also grow grapes um, here, here in the US. The symptoms have some similarities. You can see there is um, in between the veins and on the edge of the leaves, there's drying. Sometimes uh, they are yellow. Sometimes they are red. Sometimes you have a combination of the three. Often we see these at their most severe um, between verasion and harvest. And uh, the leaf symptoms will, will typically form on the same shoots growing from the same part of the vine every year. Gradually over time, they will get more and more severe. And, um, but it can be a gradual decline. It can take five, 10 or 15 years for this to happen. And all, all along, you will see a reduction in the vigor of the vine too. And these unique symptoms, I should, before I go on, I wanna mention, they are thought to be due to um, toxins that, are, um, that the fungi, which live in the wood, make. And these toxins get sent out to the leaves, to the fruit, and they are thought to be in part responsible for these very unique symptoms. Some of the pathogens that cause ESCA um, when you dig into the wood, you can see their internal wood symptoms. And um, if you cut away the bark, you can sometimes see them appear as black lines. If you cut right through a cordon or an infected spur or a trunk, they appear as spots. Another set of escapathogens, which are actually wood decay fungi, cause a visible um, and textural degradation of the wood. Um, they cause a type of wood decay. Um, depending on the fungus, this can be um, kind of white or brown in appearance. Um, but again, you can just by looking at this picture, you can see that you know this is exactly the type of thing you want to prevent. You want to do everything you can to prevent this from happening because the only way to cure it is to cut it out. And because these symptoms are internal, you can't see them, so it's very difficult to know what to cut out. Rarely, um, ESCA also causes fruit symptoms. And again, this is thought to be due to the toxins that the fungi make in the wood. Um, this fruit symptom is called, um, appears as fruit spots. Um, this is a Cabernet Sauvignon cluster, obviously before verasion, um, so you can see the spotting on it. What's most common with ESCA though, is um, its impacts on ripening. Here are clusters of grapes in the state of Washington, uh, which is north of us here in California. This cultivar is uh, Grenache. And you can see visibly that this cluster here in the center, there are many berries on it that are not ripening. And yet these grapes were to be harvested one week after we took this picture. Even in clusters that look uh, like they are ripe, they will never ripen fully. All of the standard measures for juice quality, like um, pH, titratable acidity, bricks, will all be um, delayed in vines with ESCA. ESCA can also have a, a completely different course of symptom development, which is a very rapid vine collapse. It's technically known as apoplexy. And the whole vine, 
rather than individual shoots will die. And, and this can happen within one week. Often for us in California, we see apoplexy happening in vineyards where we've seen the other symptoms of ESCA for many years. Um, but it's not always the case. Sometimes it can be the first indication that ESCA is present in a vineyard. Um, apoplexy also seems to be common in years, uh, in, in um, times of the summer when we have uh, many days of hot weather. So high um, temperatures in the high 30s and low 40s for seven or 10 straight days. This is when we see the first um, apoplexy signs. We as researchers do not know why ESCA sometimes causes this rapid vine collapse. And this symptom and the, the leaf symptoms, the fruit spot symptoms, um, those are seen all around the world, wherever ESCA occurs. If we consider all the pathogens that cause trunk diseases, there are several sources of the inoculum. Vines can be infected by spores that um, spread by rain, by wind, or also spores that might be present in the soil. And this all depends on the pathogen. Some of them can spread in many different ways. Others can only spread in one way. Um, vines in the vineyard and mother vines in the nursery can be infected similarly in the field. Um, but in the nursery, there's additional steps of the propagation process that put vines at risk of contamination. For example, um, when dormant cuttings are made and they're bundled together and they're soaked in a, a water bath together. If there's spores that are formed on the surface of one cutting, then those can contaminate all the cuttings in the water bath. Also the grafting process brings together cuttings from separate vines, um, almost doubling the risk of infection um, because spores can potentially come from two separate vines. We think of this concept of synergy of pathogens, mostly with respect to viruses, but it can also apply to um, trunk diseases and, and fungal pathogens as well. Also keep in mind that um, the grafting process creates a wound and that grafted plant that's planted in the soil has a wound at the top and at the bottom and at the graft union. And all of the trunk pathogens infect vines through wounds. So, um, grafted plants that are planted out in the field are, are very susceptible some of the, to some of the trunk diseases. Today, I'm only going to talk about trunk diseases that are spread by spores um, with, with rain and with wind. I'm not gonna talk about any of these today. Um, I suspect that some of your speakers tomorrow will cover these topics though. Most of the trunk pathogens require a wound, as I just said, this is how they get into the vine. Every year vines are pruned during the dormant season, as you know, and so pruning wounds are um, susceptible to infection. Of course, there are other wounds that can happen on the vine. However, pruning is the most prevalent type of wounding in the vineyard, and thus it's the focus of disease management here in California at least. I'm gonna talk briefly about the spores and how the fungi spread. And you might be thinking of fungi and spores and talk of that makes me think of big, beautiful mushrooms. Um, I like to eat mushrooms, go out in the woods and collect them. But, um, and I've studied fungi for many years. However, the trunk disease pathogens, they do not make mushrooms like this. They're much less exciting. They make instead these black dots that are barely visible. Here I've circled them and you can see next to this cutting, I have a marker next to it to give you a reference point for just how small these are. They're hard to find. On a Petri plate, you can see these black dots in three dimensions and they actually have a round shape. Um, this is a, a culture on a petri plate of one of the pathogens that causes Fomopsis dieback. Um, its scientific name is Diaporthiampelina. And the spores of this fungus, and it's true for also the fungi that cause Botryospheria dieback, um, 
They come out of this fruiting body in a sticky droplet. And when rain um, falls from the sky and hits that droplet it, and splashes away, it carries the spores in it. And then those spores stick to wherever the rain lands. And this um, type of spread of um, some of the trunk diseases is, is very short distance, you can imagine. But if you have a lot of these black dot fruiting bodies on a vine um, and they only need to spread to um, a pruning wound that's less than uh, a third of a meter away, you can imagine the disease spreads very efficiently in this way. We as scientists um, can study spore spread. Um, and we can study how, um, which fungi are making spores at different times of the year. And we do this often with a very simple technique. It's a microscope slide that's covered in Vaseline and we clip it to uh, a cordon or a spur. And then after rain, we go collect these from the vineyard. We wash the spores off in the lab. We can look at them under the microscope. We can try to culture them. We can also uh, use DNA-based techniques to identify them. Researchers that have used this, uh, this type of spore trap for many years to study trunk diseases around the world to learn mostly when there are the most spores. The idea being that when you see a lot of the spores forming, maybe that's a bad time to prune or that would be a good time to protect wounds with fungicides or other protectants. Um, and to the growers, I said earlier that we've done a lot of surveys of growers to find out more about um, their practices in the vineyard. Um, but we've also asked them what they think about what we do as scientists and the data we present to them. And when we ask them about the different the information on the spores, particularly, they felt that the data was very skewed. And that is because um, many of them said that, uh, of course, there are many spores in badly diseased vineyards, but what they wanted to know was what happens in normal vineyards. Um, also, sometimes the, the data that that has been um, generated, which is really useful for me to a, a researcher, but a grower might think, well, it's only about one trunk disease and I have multiple trunk diseases in my vineyard. Um, you know, what about that type of information? So we in our lab um, carried out a project to find out more about uh, what happens in healthy vineyards. You know, most spore trapping studies have not been done in vineyards that look like this. Also, the growers really just want to know what happens at the time of the year when they're pruning, um, not necessarily during the rest of the year. So we did a study. Um, we looked at vineyards in six vineyards um, that were young, and we compared those to six vineyards that were mature. And we selected the vineyards strictly on the basis of the cultivar. We picked Cabernet Sauvignon. We did this study when um, it was the dormant season, which for us is, was December through March. And each year for four years after um, we had big rain events, we would gather the trap, the spore traps and put new ones out in the vineyard. Our study was done in two different regions of Northern California, Napa and Lodi with six sites in, in each. And here I, I have a map here of Northern California. This is, the, you can see the San Francisco Bay Area in the middle. And um, here you can see the Napa sites. They were all within a pretty short distance of each other and then the Lodi sites. And I wanna mention, you know, for those of you who are not familiar with these areas, these regions are important wine grape growing regions of California. Um, the Lodi area happens to be part of uh, the San Joaquin Crush District, which is responsible for the majority of wine grapes in the state. Um, and in Napa, we have um, lower, uh, lower acreage and fewer, um, fewer tons per acre. Um, but typically, the big difference is it's more of a, what we call premium wine grape region. The, the, the fruit is sold for a higher price and made into wine that costs more money. Here you can just see the rainfall patterns in each of these columns in black shows how much rain there was during our spore sampling periods. And these 
periods represent four consecutive winters. So this is for us December through March of 2013 to 2014. And then this is 2014 to 2015, 2015 to 2016, 2016 to 2017. Um, we had more rain obviously in Napa and this scale goes up to 25 centimeters, both of these. So you can see all of these columns are taller for Napa in general than for Lodi. Um, you can also see that um, this first and second years were very dry for us. And the rain came at different times. In the first year, very little rain in the beginning of winter. Most of it fell in the springtime. In the second year, it was the opposite. Most of the rain came in the early part of the winter. The last two years were really the only years where we had uh, a proper level of rain to collect data on the spores, which I'll show you in a minute. And in fact, this last year of our study was the fourth rainiest year on record for the state of California. I'm just gonna briefly show you the results we had for the fungi that cause Botryosphaeria dieback. And I just have listed them by their initials. There were nine total. And um, we had, but we had similar results for the Fomopsis dieback pathogens too. Um, I wanna point out here for the mature vineyards, we had the most detections of fungi um, that cause Botryosphaeria dieback. And that was not a surprise because the thought is that as vineyards age, they accumulate more and more infections and thus you'd expect there to be more spores. Whereas the young vineyards had very few spores. In the first two years, which I said earlier, which were very dry, we had only two total detections in the first year, both were from mature vineyards and the same results were true in the second year, only two total detections. So really the impact of the dry seasons can be, um, could potentially have, you know, long-term effects on these diseases. However, once the rains came back in the third and fourth years of the study, we had um, spores come, coming in both the mature vineyards and also the young vineyards. Now as a grower, you, you have no idea when it's going to be a dry winter or a wet winter. So all you can do is pick a practice to protect your vines and do it routinely every single year. Because in these wet years, we think, you know, this might be really when these long-term diseases really become established and, and even in the young vineyards as well. So um, what I tell growers and, and, and our management practice in California, we really try to focus them on preventing trunk diseases. And we ask growers to um, start using these practices when the vines look healthy, um, but are young. So one to three years old. And in a vineyard like, uh, like that of this age in California, wouldn't expect to see any symptoms of trunk diseases at all. When a vineyard is between eight and 12 years old is typically when we see the first symptoms starting to appear. Uh, they become very obvious at this time. Here you can see a vine where all of the shoots on one cordon are stunted and there's even a dead spur here. Often in vineyards of this age in California, we'll find some symptom of a trunk disease on approximately 20% of the vines. And when the vineyard reaches 15 years, it can be a much greater percentage of vines that have symptoms, as high as 75%. Those with symptoms, the symptoms will be more severe too. These diseases, as I said earlier, they cause, they gradually worsen over time. And it can take 10, five, 10 years for the symptoms to get worse and worse. Here you see a vine with the cordon where it's missing spur positions. All of the shoots are extremely stunted and shoots like this, won't bear fruit that will ripen properly. Preventative practices have been shown in study trials to minimize infections of pruning wounds. And these practices are delayed pruning and using applications of fungicides or protectants after pruning and before rain. And most of our research we have done 
when we use these protectants, we, um, we've sprayed them using a tractor um, because that is what most of the growers do. Now, just to give a description of delayed pruning for those of you who aren't familiar with this approach, um, after vines are pruned, the wounds are susceptible to infection from spores produced with rain. And studies on pruning wound susceptibility in California have been done on the Eutypa dieback pathogens and the Botryosphaeria dieback pathogens. Um, and Jose Orbez Torres, I'm sure, is going to talk with you tomorrow about the Botryosphaeria dieback pathogens because he's the one who did most of that work. But these studies have shown that generally um, pruning wounds are susceptible for the longest period of time early in the dormant season. It can be up to three to four weeks. Whereas as the dormant season goes on in California between December and January, you have this long period of susceptibility. And so we recommend that growers do not prune during this time. It isn't until February that the period of susceptibility decreases. And in March, it can be only a matter of one or two days. So this is when um, we recommend that growers prune later, as, as late as possible. Of course, if that's not a possibility, one thing you can do is prune earlier, but um, spray a protectant or a fungicide on the wounds before rain. If you use this approach, you have to keep in mind though that rain will dilute the efficacy of the, of the fungicide. It can wash it off. And so if you have a lot of rains, you may have to spray two times. If you're waiting to prune until February or March anyways, um, and if there is very little rain, obviously you may not have to spray that much. I have to mention though, of course in California, um, we've had some very strange weather patterns with our rains during the dormant season. And sometimes we get all of our rain in March or February. And so, Probably the best approach is to use a combination of delayed pruning and fungicide applications, no matter what, where, what, what year it is. There are materials, there are fungicides that and, and other protectants that have been shown to work in what I think are some of the best published studies. Um, and these have been replicated over time. Um, Thiophanate methyl and pyroclostrobin have been shown in several different studies done around the world against the Botryosphaeria dieback pathogens um, and to some extent, some of the ESCA pathogens to be very effective. Um, these fungicides are not um, toxic to the spores specifically. Um, once they're sprayed on the pruning wound and a spore lands on a pruning wound, that spore can still germinate. But when that fungus starts to grow and elongate, that's when these two fungicides kill the, the fungus. The boric acid paste is different from these two fungicides, however, in that it does it is thought to form a toxic barrier. So spores will land on it, but once they germinate, they die. And I'm just gonna show you a little bit of our, um, our fungicide data from uh, studies we've done on table grapes. This comes from a study that's, that's still ongoing. Um, we, um, this is for one of the Botryosphaeria dieback pathogens, Neofusicoccum parvum. And the point I wanna make is that, um, you know, even the most effective fungicide does not always protect every single pruning wound. Um, these values within the table represent the percentage of pruning wounds that were protected. So when we do these studies, we prune the vines, we spray them, then we go through and we inoculate them with the, with the fungi each and every pruning wound. And then we go back to the vineyard a month later and we cut that piece of wood, we bring it back to the lab and we see if the fungus was able to penetrate through the layer of the fungicide. And so you can see here against just this one trunk pathogen, Neofusicoccum parvum, that pyroclostrobin was very effective in all three years. It protected 
as little as 83% of the pruning wounds. Um, and, it, and in one year, it was 100% of the pruning wounds. Whereas some of the other fungicides did not work as well every single year. But um, the year has a big effect on how well the fungus can become established or not. And here I've shown you that I, I, it's the same exact table, but I've added in the information about what, um, what happened to the, to the pruning wounds that we inoculated up that all we did was spray them with water. There was no fungicide there. So in those, you'd expect the fungus to be infecting all of them, but it's not all the case, always the case every year. So in 2018, this was a, a really, really dry year for us. And um, many of the pruning wounds did not get infected by this fungus. And it turns out that that year also happened to be a year when you know, all the fungicides worked really well <laughs> at preventing the fungus from getting in. And that's because it just turned out to be a dry year. It was a bad year for the fungus. Um, but in any event, um, yeah, our fungicide results can vary a lot from year to year. And they, they, they also vary a lot from pathogen to pathogen. As I said earlier, these fungi are not genetically related. So just because a material works against one doesn't mean it's going to work against all of them. I want to get back to this point about the timing of when you start to use these practices. And in surveys we've done of growers to find out which pre preventative practices they uses, use, we also ask them when they start to use the practice in the vineyard. So the majority of growers who we surveyed, and these results are from a survey of wine grape growers in California. Of the growers who said they use protectants like fungicides or the boric acid paste, 55% of them said that they started to use this in the vineyard when it was between eight and 12 years old or 13 or more years old. Of the growers who said they delay pruning, 65% of them said that they start when the vineyard is eight to 12 years old or 13 or more years. The problem is that vineyards of these age ranges are already infected. Yes, if you start using these practices, you will prevent infections of new wounds, but there's no way to, to take care of the wounds that are already there in the vineyard. And I wanna mention that you know, the costs of these practices are very low on an annual basis. For example, if you consider delaying pruning and you're paying, you know, in California it can be anywhere from $150 to $250 per acre to pay for a pruning crew. Um, if you just do that at a later time in the winter, it doesn't cost you any more money, theoretically. And if you want to put on a fungicide application, spray a fungicide using a tractor, in addition to pruning, it can cost approximately 64 more dollars per acre. It's a minimal cost, but the benefits are huge. You know, the benefits are maintaining profitable yields for longer and as long as possible. This is a similar figure that I showed you earlier with the, what happens after 25 years in a perfectly healthy vineyard versus, it, versus in a badly diseased vineyard. And here I've also shown what happens when you start using one fungicide application per dormant season. If you start in years three or five, you can significantly cut the losses that would happen if you did nothing. By, 20, after 25 years, and again, this is for one acre of Cabernet Sauvignon in the Lodi region, you would expect to make a cumulative profit of $12,784. If you start using a fungicide application in year five, it's approximately half that. If you wait until year 10, however, you're still ending up with a negative dollar amount after 25 years. So the message is clear, don't wait, start early. I also wanna mention that when we modeled this um, using an econ this economic simulation, we made the assumption that only 50% of the pruning wounds were protected. And that's a pretty low rate if you think about it. Um, it's only half of them and that can bring about great benefits. In the fungicide study that I showed you the data for, 
you know, um, the lowest number I think was, was maybe 70 or 60 or 70%. So it was, it was higher than this 50%. Well, there are, there is something you can do if your vines get infected and, and some of them inevitably will. Um, there's a technique that, um, different people call, uh, have different terms for, I've seen it referred to as vine surgery or trunk renewal, but it involves um, using a chainsaw to cut the vine off above the graft union. Um, the idea is that you're cutting away most of the infections that have occurred through the pruning wounds over years. And assuming that this root system is healthy, you have a fully functioning uh, mature vine root system to grow a whole new vine and relatively rapidly you can return to maturity or you can return to full productivity and yields. Here's a vine where um, we performed trunk renewal or vine surgery on it in um, March, just around the time this vineyard was pruned. And I took this picture just the following October. So this is one growing season worth of growth. It's a very strong, um, growth for this vine. Obviously there's no fruit on it this first year and um, it takes time to get full yields back because you're retraining it from scratch. But once this vine starts producing, it would obviously be producing more than a replant would. We recommend that growers use this approach, however, um, before the vineyard is very badly diseased. And um, we've done some economic simulations for this approach too, where here I show the, um, the cumulative net returns or the profits after 25 years. This is for a table grape um, for Kendra, uh, yes, you have 10 minutes. Okay, very good. I'll be done soon. <laughs> Instead of showing you results for Cabernet Sauvignon, this is for a table grape. This is for Scarlet Royal, or I'm sorry, Crimson Seedless. And um, we, uh, we used our economic analyses to determine uh, what the returns would be if you used vine surgery on all symptomatic vines sometime between years 11 and years 15. I don't show the results for years 16 and on because all of the dollar amounts were negative. So that gives you a sense of, um, you know, that you should not be waiting until you're 16 or more. The main reason, um, and, I, and I wanna show the big difference here, if you do this in year 11 versus year 15, it can be a big difference in profit after 25 years. The reason for that is in part because um, if you're doing this on all symptomatic vines, the, this figure shows what we expect to happen in terms of percentage of vines that are symptomatic in a vineyard over time. In year 11, you just have fewer symptomatic vines to do this with. Then in year 15, you have almost 75% of the vineyard could potentially have symptoms. So that's far more vines to have to cut the top off of with a chainsaw, pull the pull the top of the vine away and retrain a new vine and have no yields for, for two years until it's productive again. The other reason is that, um, the, the other reason for this large difference in profits between years 11 and year 15 is that um, just as the percentage of symptomatic goes, vines goes up over time, the, pers the, the revenues go down over time. And so by year 15, you've been losing yields and thus revenues for all of these vines that are developing symptoms. And so the message is don't wait if you're going to use this technique. Once you identify vines that are already showing yield losses, they're not going to get better. And it might be good to cut the top off of the vine and retrain it from the base. So just to summarize our results on preventative practices. You know, it's important to adopt preventative practices in young vineyards. It's cost effective in the long run if you start doing this early. The combination of um, vine surgery and preventative practices is the most cost effective and it's better than using either approach alone in the long term. 
And because every vineyard is different, we don't know, um, you know, what that year 10 or that year 15 is going to look like. It's not going to be the same in every single vineyard. And so what we can say from our economic simulations is that possibly at the point of the vineyard's age, when 20% of the vines or fewer are showing symptoms, this might be the best time to start to do vine surgery on all of the symptomatic vines. That's all I have to present today. But before I finish, I want to mention that much of our research, although I work for the United States government, much of our research is funded by grants, by competitive grants. And for five years, um, I had a grant from this organization program called the Specialty Crops Research Initiative. This is the time when I first started to work with Dario very closely. And, but we had a huge research team and this grant funded nine of our labs. We worked with social scientists and economist, Jonathan Kaplan, um, a political scientist, Mark LaBelle. They're the ones who helped us do all of our surveys. We also worked with researchers who study other perennial crops, Thamus Michelades, and Dave Dahl specifically worked on pistachios and almonds, which are susceptible to some of the same exact pathogens that cause trunk diseases of grape or related species. And then lastly, I wanna mention my colleague, Philippe Rolschausen here, he's a former graduate of this department also, worked for Doug Gubler as a student for many years. Um, now he's moved on to work on citrus diseases, but he was the one who did a lot of the early fungicide work on against Utypa dieback pathogens and many other trunk pathogens in California. Um, my current funding comes from a, a specialty crop block grant from the USDA Agricultural Marketing Service, and I also get funding right now from the California Table Grape Commission. You can check out our um, project website, and then if you want to get in touch with me directly, please do not hesitate to email me. Thanks very much. Thank you, Kendra. Uh, Andy, you want to activate your your video and microphone again so we can go through some of the questions. Um, we're running a little bit late, so instead of having 30 minutes, we're going to have 15 minutes and we have uh, uh, 30 questions. <laughs> I will try I will try to summarize some questions in uh, in topics so we can uh, we can cover them uh, efficiently. And I would say that the um, there were many questions about uh, nursery practices, which I think we'll, uh, we can ask them to both of you, Andy and, and Kendra. Uh, in particular, um, uh, Andy, if you can talk a little bit about the good practices about grafting, and maybe Kendra can jump in and talk uh, to us a little bit about how um, good, good practices in the nursery may determine uh, how clean is the material uh, before planting and at planting. Sure. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, the first step is growing the mother vines properly. So that, that's where all these things are probably picking up tremendous number of diseases. So it's common in California to cut these to short heads, the uh, 10, 15 centimeters above the, above the vineyard floor and to mow all the tissue back each year and to grow them on these big mats. And they just grow in the mud essentially. So it's, it's sandy mud, but it's mud. And, it, and it's uh, during the summer, they get tremendous amounts of water. And, and I think that's where most of these diseases start. So I think the way you'd answer the question to start with would be uh, keep everything clean <laughs> and the cleaner, the better uh, and then work from there. And it's hard to start with potentially infected material. And the hot water dips we do now, in fact, are almost more like soups of pathogens rather than, than uh, treatments for pathogens. Um, so th that's problematic as well, I think, in, in terms of how they go through. And the other part is keeping things in a cycle of growth that's normal. So moving the bench grafted, green growing bench grafted materials quickly through the nursery and quickly into the vineyard is very important to, for, for success and for long-term health. Uh, the plants do better, I think. And there's less a chance of them being overwatered in the nurseries and mistreated in, in, at the growers place as well. So I think those are really key parts. Cleaner the better and a natural cycle of growth. It, it doesn't make sense to plant vines uh, that should be growing in the spring in the late summer, 
for instance. Uh, and we need to try to, to, to get away from those sort of practices too. Andy, any advice about grafting techniques? What, what we do in California and whether you have uh, experience in better, better grafting techniques or worse? It, it probably doesn't make any difference, I don't think. I think it's, it's how you manage the callusing and how long it takes to heal those plants that's more important than the grafting technique itself, um, in, in my opinion anyway. Kendra, any, any thoughts about uh, 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 heat treatments uh, in relation to trunk diseases or other? Yeah, yes, I should mention that, you know, when, when they take the dormant cuttings, um, you know, the, these, these diseases that affect through the pruning wounds and get into the permanent structure of the vine, very few of them grow in the present season's shoots. You know, it's really only the Fomopsis dieback pathogen that can do that. And so, keeping the mother vines as healthy as possible is you know, the best way to minimize the levels of inoculum in the vineyard in general. Um, we still have a lot to learn about how the ESCA pathogens spread. Um, and for example, if some of them are present in the soil you know, and you're, and you're putting grafted materials in the soil, we do detect these ESCA pathogens at the graft union and at the base of the, of the, of the dormant uh, rootstock cutting often. So I think Andy's probably right that it's all about callousing and making sure things are calloused, assuming that that makes them less susceptible to infection. But there's no regulations on infection by trunk pathogens. There are for viruses, some of the viruses, but, but not for these fungi. So the nurseries don't have to prevent the material from being infected in the first place. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, actually, it's kind of related to this uh, series of questions is uh, uh, the genetic component to both uh, uh, you know, planting an effective, uh, pl planting a vineyard effectively as well as maintaining it, maintaining it healthy. Um, there are questions about um, what rootstock traits we should prioritize when we choose a rootstock. Uh, there is a question, interesting question about we, should we always plant rootstocks that are resistant to nematodes or that's a secondary trait uh, in some cases? Um, and, uh, and what is your experience, both of you? You know, what are the mistakes that normally are, are commonly made when choosing a rootstock or a scion that actually uh, affect uh, longevity and yield over time? Um, and, and then in relation to this, how much research is ongoing in developing material that is uh, better improved for uh, um, concerning rootstocks as well as concerning maybe tolerance to trunk diseases. Uh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's not easy. But <laughs> no. <laughs> but so I, I think the, the first step is not cropping the vines at an early age, is to establish a strong, uh, well buffered rooting system. And if you don't do that, you pay the price, I think, over time. I think that's one of the, the bigger issues for me. I don't, I don't think there's a very distinctive genetic component to which rootstocks are more sensitive necessarily. It's how they're treated, how the vines are treated, how they're overgrown, how they're irrigated, poor irrigation practices, you know, leaving the drip emitters uh, on, on the trunk uh, for four or five years of the vineyard life instead of stretching them out away from the, the, those areas. All sorts of little things that can add up. But uh, again, Grapevines, one of the biggest problems is, is they're not long-lived plants. Wild grapevines are weeds. They're primary successors. They grow at the edge of forests. So they, they wait for the tornadoes and the floods and the fires to burn everything away. And they re-sprout and grow in abundance. And, and, but they don't outlive, outlive trees very often. A couple of species do, but in general not. So they're, they're not designed to be old plants. We, what we really want to do is eke out that last five years of life because it's, it's a very profitable level of in, in terms of income for the vineyard. So if we think about the traits that you will prioritize when choosing a rootstock or when you develop new rootstocks, what those will be? If it's not trunk diseases, as you said. No. Yeah. <laughs> adapt, adapt to the site properly, right? So, so high vigor uh, rootstocks on low vigor soils is always a nice maxim and vice versa uh, in terms of making a, a good decision. Uh, re reasonable cropping strategies. You know, I used to um, laugh at people who, who are convinced that it was important to grow vines on very small spaces and very small materials, but it actually makes sense. The less it grows, the longer it lives. And, and, and the easier it is probably to make uh, high quality fruit because you can 
tailor the environment so, so carefully, but it's not necessarily profitable. So <laughs> there you go, it's a, it's a problem. Uh, so related to that, actually, Kendra, uh, there is a question about some questions about uh, crop load and uh, stressed vines at early age. Uh, what's your experience uh, in terms of trunk disease appearance or hmm. longevity later on? I don't really know. You know, most of the studies that have been done on trunk diseases and, and um, uh, uh, are related to pruning practices, you know, like how, um, how many pruning cuts there are, how the vines are trained, um, which, you know, that can obviously um, have long-term impacts on the, the success of the vineyard too. Um, I would say that some of the, you know, these are wood infecting fungi and the, the wood is important for moving um, water and soil derived nutrients from the roots up to the shoots. And um, the combination of some trunk diseases and drought, for example, can, can be much more severe than either of those alone. Um, and so, you know, those types of practices that would be, you know, lead to severe drought, um, severe water stress um, that are not just climate related, but associated with your rootstock and your irrigation practices um, could, could magnify uh, trunk disease issues too. Does that help? Any, any negative, yeah, but any negative impact, for example, of, uh, of late pruning or double pruning on vine physiology? Um, you know, in relation to the, the bleeding of the vine or, you know, delaying uh, bud break. And those. Yeah, you can have delayed bud break. I mean, mm -hmm. that, can be a, that can be a problem in certain climates where you have issues ripening your fruit before the end of the growing season. Yep. And there were also many questions about alternative to, uh, to the chemistry, uh, mm -hmm. organic products or even trichoderma. We had like 10 questions about trichoderma today. Yes. <laughs> We don't have all the trichoderma compounds labeled in California like they have uh, in Chile and, and in other parts of the world where they grow grapes. Um, so that's why we don't tend to have a lot of work done with trichoderma. I've seen research presented that seems very convincing. I think the thing is that you need, the trichoderma would be, I think much like the fungicides though, in that you have to start treating the vines long before the the infections are well established in the vineyard. Uh, it's still a preventative practice. There are, some, there, there, there are some nurseries treating with trichoderma at, at the mm -hmm. grafting process <laughs> to right. begin at, the, at step one, just running through the whole right. system. Yeah, and that might be a really, that, that's a whole other approach, you know, biocontrol on nursery material. That could be a very nice targeted place to protect those wounds right after grafting or right before they're planted and rooted in the field. But I would just say, pick something and stick with it and do it when the vineyard's young. Don't stop. <laughs> cool. Uh, something that I'd like to challenge Andy with, is that I think you touched a little bit during your, your seminar, but uh, there is a question which is about how, how do you know uh, if a, a grapevine is tolerant or, or resistant to drought? Is it about the root system, the architecture, the physiology of the vine? Or it's mostly the architecture, mostly. So deep plunging root systems that are with large, uh, large structural roots as opposed to fine fibrous root systems that are very radiant on flat. Are, I think is the primary reason. However, there are there are species and and rootstocks that hydraulically lift water, that take water from depth in the vineyard soil profile and and move it into the upper part of the profile to rehydrate surface roots. Uh, there, there are species like, like Berlandieri that take up water differently through, not just through feeder roots and fine roots, but through larger structural roots too. So there, there's a real component to the drought part of it too. Uh, the, the problem has been really finding a way to quickly assay, assay, assay that and how consistently or un, inconsistently uh, the, the trait shows up in, in populations too. That's a problem as well. And for, from a management standpoint, is the water quality uh, also important when you think about um, uh, rootstock choice or, or uh, uh, how you define quality of the water and, and how they can impact? Uh, the uh, I think the most, the, the biggest worry for Chile and California is salinity and, and that, that build up and the lack of ability to, to leach water through the soil profile and pull, pull salt levels down. I think if you're gonna be drought resistant, you have to be salt resistant. <laughs> If you're going to be salt resistant, you probably have to be deeply rooted as well. 
just just in terms of the taking advantage of the architectural component at, at the same time. And I have another question for Kendra actually. Um, it's about uh, when does it make sense to do surgery and remove infected parts? And whether you have any thoughts about uh, some uh, uh, novel methods to, to achieve uh, the correct surgery? <laughs> and when instead it's time to replant? Um, uh, what yeah. is, you know, you cut, you cut the cordon, you see the infection, what do you do? <laughs> well, <laughs> I would say that um, this is another reason for not to wait till the vineyard is, you know, 15 years or older, because uh, while most of the infections happen through the pruning wounds on the top of the vine, you can still get infections happening in the trunk. They can happen especially so in vineyards that are mechanically harvested. And we have more of those every year in California. So um, you know, the risk of infection of not just a pruning wound, but also a wound in the trunk gets higher the older the vineyard gets. But um, uh, we do recommend that, you know, we're, we're starting to get this idea across to growers that as soon as they start to see a uh, vigor decline or vine capacity decreasing in a vine, no matter how old it is, that that's the time for vine surgery. Um, uh, it, you know, it, it, when you're cutting the vine right at the base of the trunk, you have that huge wound there. And so doing this during the rainy season is a bad idea. <laughs> you want to wait until, you know, the summertime if possible when it's dry. Um, you can always protect that wound with, with the fungicide or some sort of protectant. Whatever you use typically on the pruning wounds, I would use that on the, the large wound created. Um, for for trunk diseases like um, ESCA though, where we do sometimes find symptoms in the, at the base of the trunk seem to be coming from the roots. I have no idea how effective this approach is. And that's something we're studying in our lab, in the field rather right now. And uh, are you aware of different types of uh, surgery that you can do or is that Straightforward. I mean, I know, yes, I have heard of different types of surgery. I mean, I have heard that you can, um, you know, we, we, um, uh, if you could somehow remove the infection from the trunk, you know, if that, if that could potentially cure a vine, I'm not sure we haven't done that type of, we haven't done side by side studies like that yet. Um, you know, I don't know, because these symptoms tend to be internal, it's really difficult to know what the vine looks like uh, when you start cutting into it. So they're destructive procedures, no matter how you look at it. Thank you. Um, I think we cover most of the question. There were some, uh, some other questions related to other uh, cropping systems, whether it's biodynamic or organic production in California, and what is your experience, Andy and Kendra? Uh, hmm. Uh, would, would it change the way you uh, you plant your vineyard or um, your the longevity of your vineyard, your productivity, and, and so forth? I think I think more time is spent in organic and biodynamic and and dry farm vineyards on the soil preparation and, and so and site and deep deep uh, soil preparation as well to try to optimize that component. Um, and then the, I think that a lot of that is personal choice, right? <laughs> how to farm, how to grow. It's not, it's not necessarily uh, justifiable economically or scientifically, but it has a lot to do with how people enjoy growing the vines, I guess, in the first place. Kendra, your experience in controlling diseases? In the, I mean, uh, yeah, obviously our recommendation of spraying with a, with a tractor all the way down the row <laughs> fungicides is, is a, in great contrast to organic or biodynamic vineyard. I mean, that said, the cultural approach of um, not using a chemical control, but a cultural control, delaying pruning or being very careful about the timing of your pruning, you know, that, that works no matter how you're managing, whether it's biodynamic, organic, or conventional. There are also many materials like trichoderma. Um, there are other materials that are labeled for organic use. What about um, Vitaseal? Have you, have you looked at that? I, there's, yeah, there's a compound here, called, a product here called Vitaseal. We haven't done any testing with Vitaseal. It is uh, like a wax with different plant oils in it, for those of you who aren't familiar with it. Um, it, it would be expensive, to say the least, from a material standpoint to spray it, um, it but it could be very effective when applied to individual pruning wounds. 
Um, that that said, you know, there hasn't been a, an extensive amount of research done on it, but it, you know, the idea of it is promising. The thing about the fungicides that's, um, I think, one of the biggest drawbacks, other than being toxic chemicals, is that they um, they're not long lived. They might be effective for 10 days or 14 days with no rain. And um, that, that's not a long time. Whereas Vitaseal, if it, if it coats the wounds very thoroughly and it can stay there for weeks or months, that if it does that, that would be great. Yeah, there was another question uh, we had. It was about uh, how long does the protection last? Uh, and that, does a pruning wound become susceptible after the, that period is over of protection? I, I mean, theoretically it does. We're not sure. That, that wound susceptibility period, like I said, that very much is focused on the diseases that, that, that were done. The, those studies were done on Botryosphaeria and Eutypha dieback pathogens. You know, those, those rules, so to speak, might not apply to the ESCA pathogens so much or the Fomopsis dieback pathogens. Okay, I think we are, uh, it's two, two five here, right? and I don't know, um, Samuel, uh, Carolina, are you there? Uh, <laughs> do, we, do we end here or keep going as long as we, we can? <laughs> or, um, I think I, I cover most of the questions and uh, I really appreciate the time of both speakers. I think it was, was great. We had a very nice uh, uh, participation. We had, at the peak, we had 260 participants, which I believe was much larger than we had if we were in person, probably. Um, Carolina, you want to talk about the next events? Yeah. Sí, Dario. Ah, Francisco. Lo comento, lo comento yo. Okay. Bueno. Eh, estamos llegando a, al término de este, de este primer webinar. Eh, agradezco la participación de, de un público tan numeroso y tan interesado en, en formular preguntas. Esperamos que eh, la perspectiva de estos dos expertos hayan aportado eh, al conocimiento de ustedes, de sus empresas de, de, y de las instituciones donde profesionalmente colaboran. Tenemos otros dos seminarios, el siguiente será el miércoles 8 de julio, ojo, a las 11 de la mañana, es eh, David eh, Gramaje quien va a tener eh, como moderador en su conversación a, a Samuel Barros. Y el tercer evento será el viernes 24 de julio a las 3 de la tarde, que el presentador eh, habla desde la parte norte del continente americano, así que coincide con los horarios en que hemos estado conectados con, con California. Respecto a las presentaciones, eh, a todos les comento que van a estar disponibles en, a través del sitio web de UC Davis Chile, tanto eh, la, las PPT como también eh, la versión del video completo que quedó registrado en nuestro canal de, de YouTube. Gracias entonces una vez más en nombre de UC Davis Chile, de la Asociación eh, de Viveros de Chile, del Consorcio de I más D de Vinos de Chile, de la Asociación de Enólogos y eh, de la empresa Univiveros. Los esperamos entonces en nuestras próximas dos citas. Muchas gracias, Dario. Thank you, Andy, Kendra. Yeah. See you soon. Mm -hmm. Bye bye. Bye.